all right welcome welcome to the say the transcendental consciousness a long word transcendental consciousness tape group 2024 i'm so happy that you joined today in the meeting in this meeting and i started with the music real mellow because this is a day to to experience like the subtlety of stillness of withinness of not being distracted by the activities that seem to be going on outside of you no this is a day to go within and to be still and to listen and so everything is helping with that today um, there's a lot of reminders joel will remind us of it in the second step to transcendental consciousness and uh, the lovely part of it is that we take time to just sit down and listen to it sometimes you yeah it can be very helpful to do so just sit down and listen you have great ideas about what you think you should do or how to look at your situation well just sit down and listen and <laughs> and get out of the way a little bit so that's that's the practice that we do today too and um, so I'm using a little bit of the book, um, A Parenthesis in Eternity, and that is, um, say, from chapter four. I used it last week too. Chapter four is, say, going within. Is the, is the, so everything related to meditation, contemplation is right there. And the same, we use this in, the, in our meditation today too. Then in between, I say, took some of the expressions that Joel uses in the uh, in the part that we're going to listen to in the tape and yeah emphasize what is being said in fact it's like it's, it's very lovely what he's sharing it has an yeah Joel always uses somewhat the same um, say expressions from the Bible from the New Testament and that's here too we use those today like oh yeah i'm the fine i'm you know and and on and on listen i'm your servant speak lord thy servant heareth you know there's another one so this is all the activity of the transcendental consciousness it doesn't look for anything outside itself it doesn't look for someone to take over his or her responsibility for happiness no so it's like there's a lot of recognition that comes along with the expressions that Joel gives us it's not just a talk no not at all it is it is like a tip of the iceberg when it comes down to these are words that are being spoken but the real meaning lies underneath all of this and the recognition of no there is no such thing as this place no, there's no such thing as anyone outside of you. No, be still and you will discover. So these instructions will follow later, but, but it's more like we'll use it. We will use it in our meditation too. So it's like, who is waking up here? Who is waking up out of this dream of limitation, of disease, disaster and death? Who is doing that? I am doing that like there's only one waking up and that's you and it's good to rem to remember that nobody else needs to wake up so i'm saying this basically to myself right <laughs> i'm saying this to myself and recognizing the truth of it i i join you there if i accept my oneness that is given to me in every talk of joel if I remember my oneness as a vivid experience of my communion with God, I know I'm the only one that had to wake up. It's like, no, I, I, I didn't hear it. I didn't go into communion. I was the one resisting that for just a moment. Now, when I let go of that, I remember and I'm fully in communion with my creator. I, I feel the love of God literally in me. I hear the still small voice speaking to me, whispering like 
loving words, not only loving words, but words that actually bring me to life. Well, that's exactly what is the offering in every meeting that we have, but also in every tape that we listen to, and every time that you decide to to meditate, to become still, instead of something else. Like, yeah, this is this is the greatest. You could say like this is the only thing that's really natural to do that. Be still, and listen. I can now enter the true meditation or communication in which I invite God. Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. Thy will be done, not mine. After a short period of listening, of inner communication, of stillness, quietness and peace, the awareness of the presence is within me. And now I'm free to go about my day's work. The stress of the day, however, and the mesmerism of the world's animosity, jealousy and intrigue have a tendency to enter my consciousness as well as yours. And with these come disturbing moments. So there must be another period of contemplative meditation and this time it's, it may take a different form. My peace I give unto you, is the promise of the Master. Not as the world giveth, not the peace that cometh with a pocket full of money or from a bank full of bonds, not the peace that cometh from just a healthy body. My peace, spiritual peace, the, the peace that passes understanding, that peace is all I seek. That is all I desire. I do not ask for silver or gold, nor for the good of the peace of this world. I ask only that this my peace be upon me. Then I wait for those few minutes of inner communion. And again, I've prayed the prayer of righteous men because I have sought nothing but that which is the divine right of even. One, God's grace, God's peace, not only for me, but for all those who may be led into the realm of my consciousness. Royaume de ma conscience. Je peux désormais entrer dans la véritable méditation ou communion à laquelle j'invite Dieu. Parle, Seigneur, car ton serviteur entend. Ta volonté soit faite, pas la mienne. Après une courte période d'écoute, de communion intérieure, de calme, de tranquillité et de paix, la conscience de la présence est avec moi. Maintenant, je suis libre de vaquer à mes occupations quotidiennes. Le stress de la journée, cependant, et le mesmérisme de l'animosité, de la jalousie et des intrigues du monde ont tendance à pénétrer dans ma conscience, aussi bien que dans la vôtre, et avec ceci viennent des moments perturbants. Il doit donc y avoir une autre période de méditation contemplative, et cette fois, cela pourrait prendre une forme différente. Ma paix, je vous la donne, et la promesse du Maître, non pas comme le, la donne le monde, ni la paix qui vient d'une poche d'argent ou d'une banque pleine d'obligations, ni la paix qui vient simplement d'un corps sain. Ma paix, la paix spirituelle, la paix qui dépasse l'entendement, que la paix est tout ce que je recherche, c'est tout ce que je désire. Je ne demande ni argent, ni or, ni le bien ou la paix de ce monde. 
je demande seulement que cette ma paix soit sur moi. Puis j'attends ces quelques minutes de communion intérieure. Et encore, j'ai fait la prière d'un homme juste parce que j'ai cherché rien que ce qui est le droit divin de chacun. La grâce et la paix de Dieu, pas seulement pour moi, mais pour tous ceux qui pourraient être amenés à le domaine de ma conscience. All right, so continuing, continuing with, say, after this meditation, with the idea that is actually being presented in the meditation too. It's like, wait, wait uh, just a minute. It's like, wait just a minute. You have to come back to this place. You're, you're, you're literally like, you were for just a moment in the wrong time. You were actually in time. That's not where you belong. It's like, that's not where you belong. No, of course you're going to experience stress and all of this. Like, of course, because it's not where you belong. So, so here's, here's the alternative. Joel brings us in with, with my peace. My only desire is my peace. So, and, and here in the, in the talk that we will listen to, uh, it will say this too. It's like, what is the second step? Well, that's exactly what we're going to take a look at. Like, I'm, I am divine. Is what Jesus says. Like, you, you cannot come through this, but by me, which is like, yeah, there's no way of trying to figure this out. You cannot figure this out, how to do this. And, but it is given continuously. You can become still. Suddenly there's a place in your consciousness for this, because this, you, this will never leave. Yeah, like I will never leave you or forsake you. It will always be in your consciousness. A part of your consciousness, there's that always, the communion with God. You can't lose it. So this, this other part that you identify with as a human being or where we say like, okay, that's mesmerism, that's, um, yeah, that's not what truth is, that's not where my peace can be found. That thing is continuously busy with the world as you perceive it, like with the world, with all its things that are go seem to be going on. And it can keep you busy, like it can give you everything in terms of turmoil, worry, um, lack, limitation, disease, disaster, and the whole, the whole smorgasbord of lack, in fact. So here we go, actually realizing, wait a minute, I'm a branch on the vine. I'm completely connected all the time. I cannot lose that. So this, this part in which I've heavily invested, this part of what I call myself, I've invested so much in it, but it actually has nothing to do with who I am. It has to do with what I believed I, I was, but I cannot make that real to myself anymore. Like I, I need to go beyond that in my experience of myself because the separation the lack and limitation becomes like unbearable i i have enough of that i cannot do that any longer so it's like no here's jesus taking your hand here's john taking your hand here's joel taking your hand and it's like no 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 let's walk out of time Let's walk to your transcendental consciousness, your fourth dimensional consciousness, where, where you literally are stepping out of time, out of all the occupation of time. Why would you be concerned about time and all its ingredients, all its temptations and all its futilities? Why would you be, say, distracted by that? No, reach out of time literally reach for your transcendental consciousness for the consciousness that has nothing to do with this place that you appear to be finding yourself so that is what Joel gives us all the time 
in his wording, of course, in the way that he is used to express it to the ones that are coming to his to his meetings, to his class. Now here you are, <laughs> here you are, having listened to Joel for for some years, maybe quite so, maybe forty, maybe twenty, maybe thirty, maybe who knows how long, reading many of his books reading all the great lines you probably know all the biblical expressions that Joel uses to do what well Joel uses them to remind you I'm not of this world I'm not from here like my peace is not of this world not as the world giveth no I want a peace that that I want peace <laughs> what the world gives uh, giveth in old English, it's like that is not what peace is. So it is a bit like the same as what you discover during the meditation. You sink down into your stillness, you you make connection within, you open up your mind literally to receive this. You you become receptive to the to the communion that is available. And then for one moment you relax deeply into it and discover, oh my God. I was actually just sorry. I just need, <coughs> excuse me. <laughs> I was actually say um, distracted. I was just totally distracted for a moment. I really thought this is real. This world is real. With all the news and all the distraction and all the stuff that seems to bombard us, all the stations that seem to bombard us with information. It's like, no, there's really something going on. You got to take notice. Here, look at this, look at this, look at this, look at this. And and all of that. And now it's like, no, 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 no. That was just a temporary distraction. No, it is not happening. It is It is over in that sense. Like the only reality can be found within you it is not depending on a news channel. It's not depending on whoever is going to be the president. It's not depending on who's in war with whom. It's not dependable on your neighbor. It's not dependable on your partner. Like it has nothing to do with that. This is your individual choice for the truth that you recognize yourself to be. Nobody can stop you from going within. Like, no. Why? There is nobody there. <laughs> so this is also, I uh, say this, this in the step two that we're listening to later on. There's nobody outside of you taking, say, yeah, forcing you to give something to them in order. So for instance, like responsibility, thinking that somebody else is responsible for your feelings. And for your um, yeah, depression or your fear or your um, seeming lack or your lack of uh, abundance, like nobody is respon uh, responsible for that but you. It's like this starts with you. So this is where Joel is pointing to continuously. And it's great to, to see, like, yes, if I recognize it starts here, then, then a change is possible, because otherwise we, I, I would be walking around pointing at everyone. It's like, you're the cause of my disaster. You're the cause of my anxiety. You're the cause of this, and you're the cause of that. Or it is depending on the president. It is depending on the this or the that. And my youth and my parents or my whatever it's like no none of that is so and you know it very well and so it, it first of all you don't want to accept that because you feel like a little resistance to to say take the blame if you want there's no blame but to take that on to in fact allow yourself to be totally guilty of everything so you, you hesitate to do that, but when you start doing that, not that you're guilty, but you take it on. It's like, no, I cannot point it to everyone. I'll bring it on. I'll, yeah, I'm, I'm accepting this, not as my own, but something that I was like confused by. Now healing can take place because I know that none of this is so. 
I, I hand it over and I say allow healing to take place. I invite my consciousness to come to this still place where I see like here's my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. There was nothing I there was nothing to be judged. There was no there's no such thing as guilt. No, here there's something completely different going on. It has no relationship with human thinking, with human behavior or anything like that. No, this is a safe haven. This is the core of your being where, say, yeah, an expansion is taking place on a continuing basis. God is giving more love all the time. You give more love all the time as an extension of God. So that that is the truth of you, you know, that's the truth of you as it is happening in your consciousness. So it's like that's an experience, of course. I cannot say share this really with words, but I know this, that you can definitely say, let yourself be led. Take my hand. I need help here. Take my hand. I, I know this is not my place, but I don't know how to say come back or how to actually realize who I truly am. I don't know how to do that. So help me out. I, I, here's my hand. Please take my hand. Well, that is in fact the invitation that that has been given in meditation in becoming still. Like everything, every human thought becomes quiet. Now here's a bit of space suddenly and, and immediately your consciousness can be filled with light and love as the only thing that is true about you. I am the living God. I'll make it a little bigger. I am the living God, the vine, and you are the branches. Whoever abides with me, and I in him, this one brings forth much fruit, because without me you can do nothing. I am the living God, the vine, and you are the branches. Whoever abides with me, and I in him, this one brings forth much fruit, because without me you can do nothing. Like in my human limitation, I'm completely limited. If I believe that that is me, forget it. It's not going to work. But here, in connection, in, commun in communion with Source, I abide with Jesus, with God. I recognize that the Christ is living in me and I can do all things that are given me to do. Like my will is united then with the will of God. Joel says here, we have no demonstration to make except the demonstration of our divinity, of our divine sonship, the demonstration of our oneness with God. This is like the top priority of having this occurrence taking place within you, within your consciousness, allowing sufficient space for that to occur by reaching out of time, reaching in your transcendental consciousness, reaching for that. We in this work must give up the belief that there are forces working against us that prevent the harmony in our experience that someone else is responsible of our lack of demonstration. Like, no, 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 there's only one of us here. If it, if it isn't working, so to speak, if you still seem to be attached to forces that, that seem to be working against you, you have something to do. The forces will not change if you don't change your mind about it. So here's, here's a real important part. It's like here's where the healing takes place, recognizing, oh, there are no forces against me. I'm doing this to myself. That is all. Now, 
I changed my mind. Now, a demonstration can take place. Now I can be in an experience of harmony. Let this word live in me. I am one with divine. Living not by virtue or might or by power. I am living because of my oneness with divine, with God. With the infinite source, with the source of life, with the fountain of life. With a life stream and I am fed, clothed, housed by this stream of spiritual life of which I am but the emanation and expression. I am living because of my oneness with the divine, with God, with the infinite source, with the source of life. Okay, so keeping it, trying to keep it short. <laughs> Like, this is where I live. This is where I live. If I live in a place where I'm not dead yet, I'm already dead. If I live in a place like here being invited, where life is continuous, where there's a life, eternal life flow, where I'm discovering the fountain of life, which can never stop, which, which will always be there say bringing life into my being literally creating on a moment by moment basis that is where i belong this is where i can experience my oneness this is where i recognize myself to be alive that has nothing to do with this place of death and this and disaster and disease no so that is so good to remember and Joel helps us to remember that today in the tape that we're listening to. So it's the second step, realizing where you actually are abiding. I'm abiding literally in the arms of God. I'm not in this limited perspective of myself. I'm already dead. Like I'm already celebrating death instead of celebrating life. So there's no hope for me in that in that sense it's like no there needs to be a change being made i literally have to die in my humanhood in order to come in touch with the fountain of life within me that is the second step to transcendental consciousness to a to a fourth dimensional consciousness as joel says it too it's like you reach out of time you don't need any of time in order to come to your experience of life you don't need any of this so that's quite a huge step like yes of course <laughs> it is basically the only step you have to make realizing that this place never was and and that you're home in heaven you could say that you're home in heaven and and that you can experience that in this moment that you don't have to wait until you die or something. It's like, no, no, that has nothing to do with it. It's like, it is a state of mind, a state of being. Heaven is a state of being. It's not a place. And you can literally receive that in your consciousness, in this moment. Now the only question is that, are you coming with me? Hold my hand. Let's come. Let's go. Let's, let's yeah, come on home. This is where you belong. It is not, you don't have to make a sacrifice for it. You don't, you're ready for it. You don't have to wait. You're ready for it. Are we going somewhere? No, we're not going anywhere. It is right here. It is only a change of, of you, how you see yourself. All right, so I'm very curious now how Jill is going to share that with us. So we look at the second part of the talk, and uh, that's what I'm going to share with you in a second. Being, but our realized state of God consciousness. And this is true with crops. Now, in proportion then, as we have attained 
a realization of God as the only power in that degree will our crops be better and not only the crops in the gardens but the crops in every walk of life our business art profession our marriages our family life our supply all of this will be on a higher level of expression in proportion to the height of our realization and demonstration of God as individual consciousness wholly good. Now, can you not see that where we have whole neighborhoods or whole communities or whole nations living in disobedience to spiritual principles that the crops in the entire community will not be up to the standard of what a crop should be not merely because the farmers are bad insofar as any human sense of badness is concerned as a matter of fact they may even be good according to human standards but in being good it merely means well I can answer you with Paul's statement neither circumcision nor uncircumcision availeth anything well in order to be a good Hebrew you must have had circumcision so therefore you could be perfectly good and have circumcision and have a bad crop because the fact of having been good according to a church rule does not mean you are good according to God the only way that one can be good according to God is to recognize but one power and that one spiritual in other words you could obey all of the Ten Commandments except perhaps the first and you could obey all the rules of your church and go to all its services and sing all of its hymns and still be bad spiritually because obedience to law has nothing to do with Christianity you must come out from under the law that is why Moses I mean Jesus set aside the Ten Commandments it isn't going to avail you anything to obey those commandments I'll tell you what it will avail you something to obey the first commandment and the new commandment love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and love thy neighbor as thyself and this is spiritual integrity this is spiritual goodness and if you have that you have no capacity to disobey the other nine commandments that you've thrown aside in other words it is like saying that if there were no laws in your nation against theft if there are no laws with jail as a punishment you still wouldn't steal why how could you possibly have come this far on the spiritual path and not understand that loving thy neighbor as thyself means leaving his property alone whether his property is his wife or his home or his boat or his crops and certainly you would know that in loving your neighbor as yourself hands off everything that belongs to your neighbor and eyes off of it too then if you are loving God supremely you are understanding God as your supply and you'd have abundance and now what difference does it make even if they have no laws against theft and that was what the master was trying to convey we need no laws against theft we need no laws against murder we need no laws against adultery why if we are living in a love of God if we are living in a love of our neighbor how could we do to another what we would not have them do unto us and thereby we would be living in the same atmosphere in which we are living here in this room 
It sounded strange, I know, Sunday morning. I was talking to 30 men in Dartmoor Prison. And uh, I said, I, I'm not here to teach and I'm not here to preach. And I didn't come here to get something. In fact, there isn't anything you've got that I want. And they laughed. <laughs> Thinking, of course, it's pretty good for you to feel that way. But I could say the same thing right here. There is nothing that you have that I want because in living this life of conscious union with God, everything is provided at every moment of every day of which I could possibly have a need. And more than that, I certainly do not want. All right then, in that consciousness, we don't have to have any laws of thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not envy. How can you envy anyone anything that you can have if you have any need of it just by your relationship to God, not by working for it, not by inheriting it, not by deserving it, but by reason of your relationship to God, which is sonship, divine sonship. So it is then that as evil as this world appears to be today, we have far more crops than anyone needs. And I can tell you that if man's evil nature could destroy those crops, we'd be without crops today, judging from most of the nature that is being exhibited on earth. But as you well notice, crops are abundant almost everywhere where they are planted. Certainly there is lack and limitation in China, in India. Of course, they have never developed the uh, agricultural ability. They have never gone beyond. I have seen in India farm wagons without wheels. They still are not using wheels on their carts in some parts of India. They have a horse hitched up to a great big plank and things are placed on that plank and the horse hauls them without even the benefit of a little wheel. Think of that and then you'll understand why they have a lack of food. And that's only symbolic because all the way up the line they are definitely without modern means of farming except what has been added to them under their present administration. And of course they have made great progress. But taken as a nation, they are far behind the rest of the world, so is China, in the development of foods. Go to Japan and you find abundance, but you'll also find that every piece of ground is utilized for growing of food, even along the railroad tracks right up to the tracks. Nobody wastes uh, an inch of ground in Japan. If there's a space there big enough, as big as the top of this table, be assured it has something growing on it, something either for food or beauty. And uh, they have developed along modern lines. So therefore, most of the development of foods, plants, trees, flowers, is dependent merely on nature and uh, modern farming skills. But to go beyond that, you have to come into this realm of the spiritual and begin to understand that those individuals who are living most nearly in the realization of God as omnipresence, Emmanuel, are bringing forth the greater crops. And they will sometimes bring forth three ears of corn where another brings forth two. I witnessed an experience of that in Massachusetts when uh, a man, a Christian scientist, bought a dairy herd from a man who was not able to make it pay. There just was not enough milk produced to keep the proposition on a paying basis. And this Christian scientist, by nothing more than the addition of his uh, spiritual awareness, 
not only had it paying within a few months, but within a year had a very profitable enterprise and was showing more than a 20% increase in the output of milk per cow. And not through material means, but through his recognition of supply as spiritual. Of course, you can multiply this a million times around the earth wherever there is an individual with any degree of understanding of God as the primal substance, God as the multiplier, God as the activity of all formation, you will have somebody bringing forth more business, more crops, more harmony than elsewhere. The same thing is true in teaching. I have had the experience of working with school teachers. Now, one of the experiences that I had was this, also in Massachusetts, where a school teacher had not had the benefit of spiritual teaching and then came to me and had a year of continuous instruction. And one of the things that I first said to her was that you are responsible for what takes place in your classroom. Now, in uh, uh, Massachusetts, in January, February, and March, there is a tremendous absence from school because of colds, grip, and flu. Those are three bad months in Massachusetts, and I think March is probably the worst of them. But <clears throat> I told her that that need not be in her room. Also, every term, a certain amount of students are left back because they have not passed their examinations and uh, cannot be promoted. This, I told her, was within her control. And at the end of a year, this teacher had 5% absences during those months instead of the school's average of 23%. And she had no children left back at the end of her terms instead of whatever the figure had been before. And incidentally, that school teacher eventually became the traveling representative for the entire state, traveling the whole world, learning educational methods for the state of Massachusetts, rising up from just a classroom teacher to one of the highest positions in education in the entire state, just by the proof of what she had done in her classrooms. Why? Because a classroom is not a material place and children aren't human beings, and there aren't ch good children and bad children, and there aren't sick children and well children. There are sons of God, daughters of God, children of God. There are immortals, not mortals, and there are not two powers operating, the power of weather and the power of climate, overcoming the power of God. There is only the power of God, and this truth, in your consciousness becomes a law unto your business, your body, your home, your classroom, your farm. This is the entire basis of the mystical living. This is the entire basis of spiritual living, that since God is consciousness and God is your consciousness, your life is the emanation of your particular state of that pure consciousness. And the closer you come to living the life of one power, the closer you come to having harmony in every walk of your life. We in this work must give up the universal belief that there are forces working against us that prevent the harmony in our experience. We must give up the belief that someone else is responsible for our lack of demonstration. It is true, as I said before, that in some measure we knowingly 
hold back our demonstration. For instance, if an individual had an income, we will just say of uh, 25 pounds, and uh, they had two or three or four sick relatives or unemployed ones that they had to take care of, by virtue of taking care of them, they would interfere with their own demonstration temporarily. But that would not permanently be a fact because very quickly it would be realized that these members of one's family really were children of God and therefore that God's care of his own children did not deplete my income and therefore one of two things would happen. They either would become sufficiently independent as to get along or else my income would increase enough to be able to take care of them and still not interfere with my demonstration. In other words, eventually each one of us becomes a law unto himself. Eventually, and that is the goal of this work, not permitting ourselves to be victimized, but rather to believe that a thousand can fall at my left and ten thousand at my right, but it cannot come nigh my dwelling place or eventually to believe the master in the 15th chapter of John, as long as I live in this word and let this word live in me, I am one with the vine. Therefore, I am living not by virtue of might or by power. I am living because of my oneness with the vine, with God, with the infinite source with the source of life, with the fountain of life, with the life stream. And I am fed, clothed, housed by the stream of spiritual life of which I am but the emanation and expression. Now, this makes each one of us a law unto ourselves because if we are in the schoolroom, we are saying this too is the child of God under the law of God and there are no material or mental laws interfering with the harmonious operation of this room and all those therein. And in business we would adopt the same attitude. This business is the temple of God. It is fed, not by the banks and not by customers, it is fed by my consciousness. My consciousness maintains and sustains this business. My consciousness of God's presence maintains and sustains this business. My conscious union with God makes this business supported, maintained and sustained by God. And so it is that we move from my body, my home, my family, my business, my school, my art, my profession, and find that all of these are spiritually created, spiritually endowed, spiritually governed by my consciousness because they are in and of my consciousness. This is a spiritual universe and you are not in it. It is within you. Your farm is within your consciousness. Your crops are within your consciousness. Your schoolroom is within your consciousness. Your gift or talent, music, art, whatever it may be, is within your consciousness. Your home is within your consciousness. Your family is within your consciousness and God is your consciousness. Therefore, as long as you abide in the realization of God constituting your being, then God constitutes your business and your home and your body and your school Now, this is without doubt a most important point. You do not use God power 
because that would be acknowledging two powers. And the whole goal of our work is not going back to orthodoxy and believing that there is a God fighting the devil and losing out 99 times out of 100. But our realization transcends anything like that. Our realization is that since God is infinite, since God is omnipotence, nothing that claims to have power is power. Why do you think the master could be bold enough to say, resist not evil, put up thy sword? Why don't you know that if evil was a power, the master would have been the first one to teach us how to use the power of God over evil, or he would have given us a weapon or a defense against evil. But actually he stripped us of defenses against evil when he said, put up thy sword, those who live by the sword will die by the sword. And when he said, resist not evil. Why? The mystery is this, and don't try to tell this to a materialist, but the mystery is this, God is omnipotence, and God is omnipresence. And because God is here where I am and is the only power, I need not resist any appearance of evil. That is the mystery of Daniel's going into the lion's den. That is the mystery of Daniel, who ate less than all of the other prisoners and yet was the only one whose body and health remained perfect. That is the mystery of the master saying to Pilate, thou couldst have no power over me unless it came from God. So go ahead and crucify me and I'll show you that I will walk the earth again for I cannot be killed even by crucifixion. And of course, you cannot be killed by disease or by accident or by old age. And if for a moment this universal belief thinks it can do that unto you, it can only succeed if you accept two powers, if you do not live up to your transcendental teaching. Now, I do not say that because spiritual truth is true, that you can just defy evil. Not at all. You must be born again. You must come to spiritual discernment. And that is where time is the element. That is why, although many, in fact, I suppose all of the students who uh, remain with us from the time of their coming for years and years afterward, it is undoubtedly because some measure of harmony, some measure of good comes into their experience right from the start. But that in no wise testifies to their spiritual development. It probably testifies to their practitioners or their teachers. It is only as they begin to develop this consciousness of oneness, of one power, and of resisting not evil, that the harmonies begin to appear as a result of their own spiritual growth. And I have observed this, that the most spiritually prepared student still requires three or four or five years before their material state of consciousness has lessened enough to make them a transparency for spiritual good. And some who are slower, and I was one of those slower ones, it takes longer than three or four or five years. It doesn't necessarily mean we have to suffer all those years. We can get some measure of help from practitioners and teachers who will work with us as long as we work faithfully, conscientiously with them. But 
the master says it is the straight and narrow path and few there be that enter only because they cannot wait patiently for the change of consciousness the transition in consciousness that makes them a transparency for the presence and power of God. There are many, many people who wonder about the progress of the infinite way in 14 years, having encircled the globe, having found wonderful publishing houses in the United States and England, Germany, Switzerland, Holland, now Japan. Why it is that the work is so beautifully established and I'm able to keep going around the world year in and year out. Many wonder about it, but they do not realize that before I ever took a student, I practiced healing work for 16 years and waited for these specific principles to evolve, to be proved, to be demonstrated so that since the first Infinite Way book was written, not a word of principle has been changed. The only editing that has been done is in, uh, we call it cleaning it up, making uh, better formation of chapters, chapter headings, better divisions of the books, clarifying some of the uh, mistakes in punctuation and so forth that got into the early rough printings before there was any editing done. But aside from that, not a word of any principle has been changed since the first book. And why? Because after 16 years of proving principles, you have the principles pretty well established in their correctness. You have seen the demonstration of it, and you can then begin to teach. So it is. These principles have been proven, not only in that first 16 years, but now in the 14 years that have gone by since then, making over 30 years. And uh, this is room for a lot of confidence on our part in uh, the rightness of the principles. Now, see this point that in your work of bringing harmony into your body, into your business, into your home, into your family, don't go around searching for a God power. Abide confidently at the center of your being in the realization that God power already is by virtue of omnipresence, Emmanuel. God power already is, and besides this there is no power. And this power of God is not afar off. It is actually closer to you than breathing. Actually, it is where you are. That's the meaning of omnipresence. That is the meaning of Emmanuel, God with us. Here and now, where I am, God is. I don't have to make it so. And never do I have to beg God, implore God, try to influence God. Never do I have to ask God or demand of God. I merely have to realize God is. Because of omnipresence, God is. Because of Emmanuel, God is. Here where I am, God is. And God is all there is since God is infinite. And rest in that word and then watch how the enemy fights among themselves and destroys themselves. As long as you stand back as a beholder, not a wielder of power, not as if God had given you some special privilege or power to use in the world, but rather because God itself is the power and operates in you, through you, as you. And all you have to do is stand by and watch it at work. Just as when you switch on these lights at the switch, 
the light comes on. All you have to do is watch the light come on because the electricity is doing the work. And so it is. God constitutes your consciousness and God is doing the work and you are a beholder watching the glory of God, watching the sun rise and set, watching the tides come in and out, watching the crops grow, watching the fruit grow on the trees, watching the flowers on the bushes, watching the fish in the sea and the birds in the air, watching, being a beholder of God's glory being made manifest. And so you find that in uh, this great power of non-power, the non-use of the power, you have the only power there is. This is a deep point. It is so deep that although it is the essence of the Master's teaching, it has never been embraced in any Christian teaching. And yet it is the essence of his teaching. Ye need not fight. Put up thy sword. Resist not evil. Thou couldst have no power over me. What did hinder you? Pick up your bed and walk. Blind man, open thine eyes. No power. No power. And even at Lazarus' tomb, he says, I need not pray. Just Lazarus, come forth. Why? There's no other power here but life. And so it is. You can see why it takes time. We have to make a transition from using power. We have to make a transition from resisting evil. So that the minute somebody says, cancer, polio, that we don't all of a sudden rise up on our mental legs and start battling. And that takes time. It takes time to develop the state of consciousness that can say, what did hinder you? Thou could have no power. Well, this is really wonderful, isn't it? Two such nights. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. Thank you so much. Um, so this was, say, tape 338B. And yes, you can find them on the EV Hub channel. So I put it in as a podcast, so you can listen to them. It's, it's I think, ten on ten in a row, maybe eight. And they're all related to transcendental consciousness. So that's the same as today's tape. This is this is step two. Um, so I want to thank you for your presence here today. Um, we're going to play some music still, but uh, thank you so much for your attention and your presence. And I hope to see you next week. Have a lovely day. Have a great uh, night if your night is coming up. Or a great day if your day just started. And uh, see you soon. Thank you so much.